Let's go to Lord in prayer for our time of Bible study. Ezekiel chapter 30 will be our starting point. And let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you tonight again. We always thank you for your word and what it means to us. And Father, as we look into these uh, particular chapters that speak of your sovereignty and, and also your grace toward the, the people of the nation of Israel, even in their exile condition for rebellion, Lord, that we see that you have a message for these surrounding nations, Lord, that they should not gloat over the troubles that Israel is facing in judgment for their, their sin, uh, but they are held accountable as, as well. And so, Lord, I, I pray that it, it really speaks to our hearts about the condition that we find ourselves in these days. And Lord, tonight we want to lift up Pauline to you again as we've been praying for her along the way. And, and uh, uh, we thank you, Lord, that they arrived safely in Tampa, uh, that the condition hopefully is caught very, very early on and, and uh, that they will be able to apply uh, just the right medications to treat the uh, pneumonia before it even begins to uh, spread or, or have any sort of, of root there. Lord, we, we just pray that you would wipe that out quickly and that, that Pauline would be back with us uh, very soon. And uh, we pray that you be with Pastor Rick. Lord, just going through these interminable uh, waiting periods, Lord, in these medical conditions, just having to abide with his wife as he abides with you, Lord. And it's just such a great example for all of us, the, the servanthood and the sacrifice that takes place in marriage and the uniqueness of it and why it is, I think, that you have designed marriage the way that you have. And we're just thankful, Lord, again, uh, that this was caught early and pray that you would bring a swift healing to Pauline and uh, bring her back home as soon as possible. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, beginning in chapter 8, uh, 28, excuse me, in, in the book of Ezekiel, um, you had this presentation of the king of Tyre and, and the parallelism between the king of Tyre and Satan himself. And then you get into chapter 29, and, and you're looking at between chapter 29 and chapter 33, there are six distinct visions that are dated uh, that God gives to Ezekiel about the surrounding nations. And we referenced this a couple weeks ago that God is showing Ezekiel and speaking to the exiles that are with him there at Tel Abib, remembering that they're over by the river Kabar. Anytime you forget that, you can go back and look at uh, chapter 1 in the book of Ezekiel and be reminded about the setting of where they are and, and where God is giving him these visions. And so the Lord, as he did with, with Jeremiah uh, to a certain extent, and as he also did with Isaiah to a certain extent, does again with Ezekiel that not just Ezekiel, but that the people, the exiles that are with him would know that at the end of the 70 years, when they go back into the land, that they will not be threatened by these surrounding nations that really have it in for them and have always had it in for them, in particular um, Egypt. And so when you get to chapter 29, there is this, this first vision that's given to Ezekiel about Egypt in the 10th year and the 10th month. So we have specific dates um, established and, and that would have been January 7th, 587 BC if you're taking note. And, and this would have been 18 months before the fall of Jerusalem. And, and the Lord talks about the pride of the Pharaoh or the king of Egypt, sort of in, in our vernacular, uh, a, a man by the name of Hophra. And he was so haughty, so prideful in his powerful estate there that he began to think of himself as a creator god. And he took the credit for creating the Nile River. And he actually thought of himself as a god. And, and that's always a, sort of a flashpoint, especially in the life of a ruler. Um, God's going to deal with that pretty swiftly um, when, you, when you get to that, that sort of position. And in a way, it sort of mirrors um, what takes place, what will take place in the life of the Antichrist when he comes into the temple at the midpoint of the tribulation and not only declares himself to be God, but he thinks of himself as God, as it says there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. And so the second vision comes up in verse 17 of chapter 29. 
And so when we get to chapter 30, we're actually continuing in this second vision. And the thing that we need to be reminded of, and unbelievers need to be reminded of this especially, is that, you know, we think of ourselves as the church, right? We, we are followers of God. We love Jesus Christ, and we want to be obedient to the commands of Jesus Christ and, and all the commands that we find in God's Word, the, the totality of, of God's expression to humanity about the distinction between right and wrong. And the thing that becomes abundantly clear here is, you know, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're a follower of God or not, whether you, whether you love God or not, sin is still sin. And sometimes people that are outside the church, you look around us in this day, sometimes people outside the church think themselves, well, I, I, I don't believe in God, so therefore I can do anything I want to. No, that's not the case. That God still sees sin, and, and certainly judgment does begin at the house of God, but it doesn't end there. And judgment needs to begin at the house of God so that we can set the example for those outside the church that they might have a, a light of righteousness, to be salt and light to the world. And so chapter 30 begins, the word of the Lord came to me again saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, wail, um, if, it's, if you have a King James Bible, it says, howl ye, howl ye, woe to the day. And there's that, that word that we have seen three times in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, woe, woe, woe. Um, we've been through a couple of those woes so far, a third woe to come. And there is, I, I think, a prophetic link to the end there of verse 2 in chapter 30 in Ezekiel, and especially verse 3. We'll read into it and take from it what the Holy Spirit might show our hearts. Wail, woe to the day, for the day is near. And remembering that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't enjoy this part of, of the ministry. It is a necessary service to the world, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. And whenever we see that phrase, the day of the Lord, our ears need to, to perk up and our eyes need to, to sparkle and focus on what comes next. It will be a day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles. And again, these are familiar phrases to us. Um, Jesus coming on the clouds, um, the time of the Gentiles being at an end when, when you get to Revelation uh, chapter 19, uh, that, that Jesus will be coming on the clouds. And before that, you know, Jesus coming on the clouds and, and the voice of the archangel, which is Michael, uh, and, and the, the sound of that, the voice like a trumpet, and the church caught up in, in the rapture there, uh, prior to the tribulation beginning. And the sword shall come upon Egypt. Egypt has always been in the thor a thorn in the side of Israel, Judah, uh, for a couple different reasons. For one, it's a threat, and, and for two, it, it presents itself as a reliable alternative to God. Uh, they went down into Egypt to save themselves in a time of famine as a family, and they came out as a nation 400 years later, Joseph having been raised up to the second most powerful man in that land, and so God brought them out of Egypt, and once God brought them out of Egypt by showing them how despicable it was to remain in, in Egypt as slaves, slaves to what? Egypt becomes then a type of sin throughout Scripture. And, and so the sword shall come upon Egypt, and not just Egypt, their allies, uh, and great anguish shall be in Ethiopia, northern Africa. When, when the slain shall fall in Egypt and when they take away her wealth and her foundations are broken down. And you have to know that this is inconceivable in Ezekiel's day. Now, Babylon has arisen as probably the great world power in this time, but, but Egypt is a close rival uh, to that. It's kind of like the United States and, and, and the CCP right now, two great powers in the world and Egypt has presented themselves to the world, these countries in Northern Africa, like we in the United States of America in our day, present ourselves to the world as a defender of righteousness, hopefully, as a defender. Of, we are the, the respite. We are the refuge, the place that people can run when they're threatened, as in the case of Ukraine coming to us for all kinds of aid, and we are that that overarching, we are, we are seen as that great power, uh, that great, um, it seems like, 
uh, unending source of wealth that, that can be paid out for weaponry. That they, and it's the same sort of thing going on here. And so when, when the Lord prophesies the fall of Egypt, this is a huge impact on the surrounding nations, and it's inconceivable. That's the thing you have to remember. It's inconceivable to them with the greatness of this nation that it could ever fall in the way that um, Ezekiel, in the way that the Lord tells Ezekiel that it will, but great anguish shall be in Ethiopia at Egypt's fall, when the slain fall in Egypt, and when they take away her wealth, and her foundations are broken down, Ethiopia, Libya, Lydia, and, and all the mingled people, Chub, and, and the men of the lands who are allied, shall fall with them by the sword, like, like bowling pins. You know, when the, when the head pin is knocked over, it falls and it knocks down the rest of the pins as well. So, so the Lord here is going to bowl a strike and, and he's going to knock them all out with the fall of, of Egypt. And those who uphold Egypt shall fall. And here's the reason. The pride of her power shall come down. When any nation arises to the point of the prideful expression of Pharaoh Hophra, hey, I, I created the Nile, you know, I'm this... He thinks of himself as this, this immense crocodile. I'm this, this monster that no one will ever threaten, you know, and I created this, and I'm, I'm actually God, and, and the power of my decrees, you know, whatever I say, so shall it be. And so the pride of her power shall come down. That's a promise from God, from Migdal to, to Syene, cities within Egypt, those within her shall fall by the sword. And again, this is the least expected outcome for this great nation. Forget about it. This is not. This can't possibly happen. But it, it 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 ends here with this phrase that means very much to us. Says the Lord God. Says the Lord God. They shall be desolate in the midst of the desolate countries, and her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are laid waste. And here's this phrase that repeats itself over and over again. God wants you to know who He is. Did you know that? There is no, there is mystery in the Godhead, but there is no mystery about who God is. There is no mystery about the fact that God is. And so over and over again, he will use whatever means at his discretion. It might just be the back of your hand. You know, if you stop for a minute, if you have kind of good light, and you can, you can look at the back of your hand and can think about what's going on in your brain as your eyes are, or, you know, you're not... You're not seeing, there's, there's electrical codes that are going on there, and there's, you know, you've got this optical nerve that's going to some part of your brain that's able to, in the speed of light, decode the messages that, you know, the, the colors, the nuances, and you can tilt your head, and you're still looking straight ahead. How, how could that possibly be that your eyes are gyroscopic? And you, if you actually stop and think about what's going on in your day-to-day mundane existence it's fabulous it's so incredible it's it's mind-boggling it's stupendous it's glorious it's wonderful and it all points to creator god and and the the wealth and and the power and the glory of his imagining to to be able to speak these things into existence um it's just incredible stuff so if you look at the back of your hand i think or even the palm of your hand, then you shall know that he's God. That's what Romans chapter 1 tells us too, by the way, that, that creation. And if you don't know anything about theology, cre- creation screams out for the existence of a creator. Yeah, then they will know that I am God when I have set a fire in Egypt and all her helpers are destroyed. On, on that day, messengers shall go forth from who? From me in ships to make the careless, and that word careless literally means they're not careless, they're not, you know, negligent. They're, they're just so secure that they have no cares. They, they, they're not concerned. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this nation right now that they're careless. They couldn't care less about the things that are presently threatening the underpinnings of this nation, the foundations upon which we rest, uh, the truths and, and so on, and, and the, the history upon which this nation was founded. And there's just so many examples of people that could, could care less because they, f- they just feel so secure because they've never been threatened. And I, I've never been threatened in my life. I've never had an enemy at my doorstep. I mean, we, we have a, a fine example of young men and women who are willing to go to foreign 
territories and, and risk their lives for our sake. But me personally, you know, it's, it's about, you know, decorating my house and stuff, painting the rooms, when, you know, painting, painting the outside of our house, keeping the maintenance going. The kind of threat that we're talking about here is, is almost inconceivable. It's almost inconceivable. And, and so we've never had to face it. And, and that's the way these Ethiopians were. A great anguish shall come upon them as on the day of Egypt, for indeed it is coming. And thus says the Lord God, I will also make a multitude of Egypt to cease. How? By the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It's important to see how God is using an instrument in order to affect his will in the world, that, that he is employing Nebuchadnezzar. And this is the kind of statement that's said over and over again in God's word, and it reminds us that, you know, you can be an instrument in God's hands, that that even as, as wicked as Nebuchadnezzar was, and there's some indication, uh, we'll see it when we get to uh, the book of Daniel, that Nebuchadnezzar kind of comes around through you know, the Lord sort of turning him into a, a sort of an animal there in, in the midst of his, his boasting, but he, he comes to his, his senses and, and he writes about the glory of God having come out of that experience. But in the meantime, God is using Nebuchadnezzar, this, this wicked, wicked, king of Babylon as an instrument in his hands to bring down the pride of the Egyptian people, he and his people with him, the most terrible of the nations. They were feared because of their brutality when they took uh, a country down. Shall, shall be brought to destroy the land. Nebuchadnezzar shall be brought to destroy the land. There shall be a desolation. They shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. And, and environmental impacts, I will make the rivers dry, those rivers that Egypt depends upon, and sell the land into the hand of the wicked. I, I will make the land waste and, and all that is in it by the hand of aliens. I, the Lord, have spoken. And so we have certainty that this will happen. And indeed, when you look at world history, you'll see that it did. You can study the Babylonians conquering Egypt on the pages of your world history book. And thus says the Lord God, I, I will also destroy the idols and cause the images to cease from Noph, which is what we call Memphis. There shall no longer be princes from the land of Egypt. I will, I will put fear in the land of Egypt and in the, in the place of pride. That's, that's, you know, when you get so prideful, uh, the only thing that can take away that pride is fear, and, and God affects that. He, he brings that about through bringing the Babylonians against the Egyptians, and so I will put fear in the land of Egypt to take the place of their pride. I will make Pathros desolate, set fire to Zon, and execute judgments in No, which is Thebes. I will pour my fury on Sin, which is also known of as Pelusium. I will pour my fury on Sin, an interesting name for a city in, in this regard. Uh, the, and it's referred to as this, the strength of Egypt. I will cut off the multitude of no and set a fire in Egypt. Sin shall have great pain. No shall be split open and Noph shall be in distress daily. Just to remind you where we started that just because these nations don't believe in God doesn't mean that they escape the peril of their sin. There is, there is no escape. If you're a sinner, you're going to be judged for your unrighteousness. We remember that you know, in Jeremiah chapter 43, we had this interesting passage because Jeremiah was in amongst a bunch of people who were trying to escape Babylon in Judah at that time and thinking, again, that Egypt is a reasonable alternative. In fact, they, they sort of brought it down to the place of Egypt being the only alternative, and they, they actually gave the impression of coming to Jeremiah to ask him about what they should do in order to escape the onslaught of the Babylonians. God told Jeremiah, tell them to stay here and I'll protect you. But they, and Jeremiah told them that. And they said, no, that, you know, forget about it. We're going to Egypt. We don't, we don't care what God says. We don't place our trust in God's word. And they did head down to Egypt. But before they headed down to Egypt, Jeremiah prophesied to them in Jeremiah chapter 43 that the very place that we're headed to and the very place that we arrive at will be the very place, the very stones upon which Nebuchadnezzar will place his throne. And so you're trying to, you're, you're actually running to the worst possible outcome that you could head to, but they still didn't listen to him. They still didn't believe him. 
And then later on, we see the fulfillment of that in Jeremiah chapter 46, where God speaks of, again, like this chapter, his judgment on Egypt. So I will cut off the multitude of no and set a fire, verse 16, in Egypt. Sin shall have great pain. No shall be split open and naw shall be in distress daily. The young men of Avon and pi Beseth shall fall by the sword. And these cities shall go into captivity. At, at Tapa, boy, take that one. Uh, I can't quite tackle that one. Whenever I come to it, I always use, I just fall back on Tapanes. At, at Tapanes, the day shall be shall also be darkened when I break the yokes of Egypt there. And, and so we're talking about all the major cities of this powerful, powerful nation um, being broken down. When I break the yokes of Egypt there and her arrogant strength shall cease in her. She doesn't have, just have strength, she has arrogant strength. And that's what we as the most powerful nation in the world, we should be on guard against that. Because the fact that we have strength is a great blessing from God. And once we begin to take credit for that, that, that arrogance is what is going to cause the United States to cease to be, perhaps. Um, there's no, you know, we, we see... When we get into end times prophecy, we see no record of the United States there. No, no definitive record of the United States being in any, not only not a significant player in the world at the time uh, of the end times events, but not even mentioned. Uh, some people, you know, read into words like the coastlands and think that, you know, that could apply to the United States of America, but there's no direct reference to the United States of America. So. We know that in our future, between now and perhaps the, the rapture will be the cause of the downfall of the United States, perhaps, uh, but at least between now and sometime after the rapture, maybe even before the rapture, the United States is, is you know, going to come into some sort of uh, catastrophic end. Uh, it, it certainly seems that way. It came to pass in the 11th year, this is yet another vision, this is the third vision, and again, it's, it's dated, it's, it's April 29th, 586 B.C., and it came to pass in the 11th year, in the first month, on the seventh day, did I skip verse 19? Thus I, shall, I will execute my judgments on Egypt, and then they shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, this cloud is going to cover over Egypt and bring judgment. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first month, on the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, again, April 29th, 586 B.C., the third vision, um, just a, a brief period of time, um, about 18 months before Jerusalem fell, son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and see, it has not been bandaged for healing, nor a splint put on to bind it, to make it strong enough to hold a sword. So you know, strength is always depicted by your arm, your right arm, usually, um, is a depiction of strength. And again, we talk about all the time about the Bible being a book of pictures. And here we have pictorial language that God is employing so that we can envision Okay, the, the Pharaoh who was thinking, first thinking of himself as God and seeing himself as this giant crocodile or sea monster, however he, he thought of himself and the creator God and the creator of the Nile and all that. Now his, his arm is broken. His, his source of strength is broken. You can imagine that. Um, both his arms. I will break his arms, both the strong one and the one that was broken, and I will make the sword fall out of his hand I will, and imagine trying to fight with broken arms. Anybody ever had a broken arm? I've never had one. I've only heard that it's, it's pretty excruciating. But uh, to think about you know, having your arms broken and then have somebody come against you, well, it doesn't matter what size sword you've got, you're not gonna be able to use it, are you? Because your arms are broken. And this is the point that God is making here. And I will make the sword fall out of his hand. I'll, I'll scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. That's, again, this is inconceivable stuff that, that this could happen to this powerful nation. I, I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon. And, and you know, relatable is like when, when Egypt and Babylon went to war, there was no telling who was going to come out on top. That's how strong Egypt was 
thought to be. I, I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, and I will put my sword in, in his hand, but I will break the Pharaoh's arms, and he will groan before him with the groanings of a mortally wounded man. Thus I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, and the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down, and then they shall know what? What will they know? They'll know that I am the Lord, because it's, this is inconceivable. It must be God. When I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he stretches it out against the land of Egypt, I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. Then, what will they know? Then they shall know that I am the Lord, because they refuse to know that now. That's when they will, when they are brought down low. And remember, it, Egypt is the home team. And if there's anything that we've learned in our day is it's almost impossible to capture a country, isn't it? I mean, you can, you can conquer, you can declare yourself the winner of a war, but to actually conquer the people of a nation is, it's nigh unto impossible. Why? Because you're the visiting team. And, and the home team will fight like the Dickens for their homes. And even if you declare a victory over them, even if you win the war, then you're facing insurrections and all that sort of stuff. You're just never going to get to that place of, of having a peaceful existence. And so that's why in their day they came up with this program of just driving the people out of the land. The, the, and, and they would replace it with people from other lands that they had previously conquered. Sort of a, a relocation going on in the case of the Egyptians. They were, they were scattered all over the world, kind of like, kind of like the Jews. And now we have yet a fourth vision, um, 13 months before Jerusalem fell. Uh, this is January the 21st, 586 B.C., chapter 31. Now it came to pass in the 11th year in the third month. And again, you know, this doesn't really sound like nebulous, you know, talk. This is very precise, very dated. And so we know that we're, we're talking about real historical events here. So it came to pass in the 11th year, in the third month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, whom are you like in your greatness? Indeed, and God begins to compare this prideful greatness that the Pharaoh has, thinking of himself, to Assyria, a once great nation, that has already fallen. And so we kind of relate to that when we think about how great the United States of America is and we look back to previous great civilizations. And so we're, you know, in and around that 250-year-old mark and we look back to the Romans or the Greeks and we see, you know, as great as those civilizations were, they all fell. And mostly they fell from decay from the inside, just like we're experiencing right now. So whom are to the Pharaoh? And obviously, you know, the interesting thing is Ezekiel never has a chance to talk to Pharaoh. But he says, say it to Pharaoh. So he's speaking prophecy to the people that he is exiled with by the river Kabar. We have to stop and remember that. Now, the pages of history will speak to Pharaoh. And the pages of history will speak back to us about the what is declared by Ezekiel. He's actually speaking to the exiles that are along with him. He's not speaking to Pharaoh, but he's speaking about Pharaoh, and he might as well be speaking to Pharaoh. And for these people to think in their own minds, whom are you like to imagine themselves to be Pharaoh? Whom are you like in your greatness? Indeed, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon. We remember how great Assyria was at one time. Um, with the fine branches that shaded the forest uh, about, you know, 120 years earlier, and of high stature, and its top was among the thick boughs. And again, the Lord employs pictorial language. He likens Assyria to this great tree that Egypt now thinks of themselves as, as well. The waters made it grow. That's, that would be the Nile River. Underground, the waters gave it height with the rivers running around the place where it was planted and sent out rivulets, and the Nile Delta, um, sent out rivulets to all the trees of the field. 
Therefore, its height was exalted above all the trees of the field. Its boughs were multiplied and its branches became long because of the abundance of water as it sent them out. All the birds of the heavens made their nests in its boughs. Under its branches, all the beasts of the field brought forth their young. And in the shadow, all great nations made their home. Egypt, this great world power that everyone looks at, all the other smaller nations, all the less powerful nations, look to Egypt um, to be the source of their strength. And, you know, Egypt in this, in this likeness, this great you know, cedar tree, this, this massive tree that all the other nations come and rest in the shade of that tree. Very, very beautiful pictorial language. Thus it was beautiful in greatness and, and in the length of its branches. Again, this sounds just like the United States of America to me. Because its roots reached to abundant waters, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide it. The fir trees were not like its boughs and the chestnut trees were not like its branches. And he says something interesting. No tree in the garden of God was like it in beauty. Think about that. I made it beautiful with a multitude of branches so that all the trees of Eden envied it. And what he's talking about there is, you know, you think about Eden as this idyllic state. So all the kings of the earth look to Egypt with envy. That all the trees in Eden envied it that were in the garden of God because God has planted all these nations. God has planted all these people groups around the world and, and anthropologically that's, that's a very interesting study when you look at, at Genesis chapter 10 and that, that table of nations that even anthropologists say is one of the most thorough um, well presented discussions about the dispersal of the various civilizations around the world and it's it becomes inarguable in its, in its presentation. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have increased in height, because you have become prideful, height is likened to pride, and set its top among the thick boughs, and its heart was lifted up in height. Again, another reference to how prideful they had become. Therefore, I, so we know the source of this, Therefore, I will deliver it into the hand of the mighty one of the nations. And the reason is because power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's what's happened in the nation of Egypt. And he shall surely deal with it. I have driven it out for its wickedness. And aliens, the most terrible of nations, Babylon, have cut it down and left it. Hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. Its branches have fallen on the mountains and in all the valleys, its boughs he has broken by all the rivers of the land and all the peoples of the earth have gone from under its shadow and left it. And that's what happens when a once powerful nation falls. Everybody has to flee. Everybody has to get away from it or else they get squashed in its fall. They run from it. Uh, you think you have allies. Well, you have allies as long as it looks like you're reasonable in your, your ability to protect them or provide for them. But once that's over, they go looking for other allies that can, can perform that work. On its ruin will remain all the birds of the heavens and all the beasts of the field will come to its branches. Thinking about you know, all the dead bodies being consumed um, so that no trees by the waters may ever again exalt themselves for their height nor set their tops among the thick boughs, that no tree which drinks water may ever be high enough to reach up to them. For they have all been delivered to death, to the depths of the earth, among the children of men who go down to the pit. And that's, that's the, the destination. That's where they're, they're headed. They're headed to uh, hell in, in, in our vernacular, what's referred to here as, as Sheol, the the bottomless pit, that, that great place that we saw there in Luke's gospel, chapter 16, that Abraham's bosom on one side in one compartment of Sheol, uh, and then hell, Sheol on the other side, a uh, place of torments, uh, Lazarus and, and the rich man in their differing experiences there. So 
these wicked people, hey, I didn't know God. I, I, I wasn't a follower of God. Well, the result is going to be the same as if you did know God and you, know, you walked away from God. Thus says the Lord God, in the day when it went down to hell, Sheol, I caused mourning. I covered the deep because of it. I restrained its rivers and the great waters were held back. I, I caused Lebanon to mourn for it. And all the trees of the field wilted because of it. I made the nation shake at the sound of its fall. When I cast it down to hell together with those who descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden and the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water were comforted in the depths of the earth. They also went down to hell with it, with those slain by the sword. And those who were its strong arm dwelt in its shadows among the nations. To which of the trees in Eden will you then be likened in glory and greatness? You shall be brought down with the trees of Eden to the depths of the earth. You shall lie in the midst of the uncircumcised, uh, those that are apart from the covenant of God. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, says the Lord God. So don't look to Egypt, you people of Judah. Don't look there for your rescue because they're going to be destroyed. It's fruitless to look in that direction for salvation. You know, Egypt, it, it doesn't matter the time frame or the enemy that Judah or Israel faced. They always saw Egypt as a reasonable alternative that they could turn to in an emergency. And God says, no, no, they're going to be destroyed. And the interesting thing about this is that for a long time, Egypt was the most powerful nation in the history of the world. And, you know, they began to decline and then they were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and they have never become a world power again. And that's exactly what the word of God said would happen. And that's kind of amazing because they were a world power. What is it that could take such a great world power with all these resources and all this military might? What is it that could destroy this this world power to the extent that it never, it never returned to any sort of, of world domination or even the domination of other countries. And you know, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing if you think about it that you know, where they wound up uh, in history and, and all we have to do is think about current events today. You know, where, where does Egypt rank in the you know, table of nations that, that presently exist when it comes to, to being a world power? They just aren't. They, they have never, um, exactly as God said, they have never regained that status. And God talks about the destruction of Babylon, the people that destroyed Egypt, just on the level of history, and, you know, look on your map and, and see what happened to the Babylonians. They're, they're gone. They, you know, they, they no longer even exist. The, the Egyptians got scattered and, and, and brought back to their homeland, but they never became a power again. And now in chapter 32, God speaks specifically to or about the Pharaoh himself, not just the nation, but the, the very leader of this nation. And it reminds us of the, the responsibility that leaders bear. God sees leaders as being a cause of people turning away from him, or God sees the pride of a leader being an affliction in, in his followers. And it came to pass in the 12th year, again, specifically dated. This is the fifth of six visions. In the 12th month, on the first day of the month, and this would have been March 3rd, 585 B.C., that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Again, God doesn't enjoy this. Take up a lament. We're going to lament that this prideful man is about to fall. And God says, you know, you would think this might be a, a, a song of celebration or dancing or whatever it is. No, it's a lament. And to keep the heart of God's people, God's chosen people in the right place, that, that they would be lamenting 
the downfall of Pharaoh rather than enjoying it or celebrating it. There's no joy in the downfall of your enemy, God says. And, and that's something that we need to keep in mind all the time. Um, to Pharaoh, God says, you know, essentially, in your own mind, you are like a young lion among the nations, and you are like a monster. We remember he referred to himself as a, as a monster in chapter 29, verse 3. That's the way you think of yourself, you know. Uh, nobody can take me down. You're, you're like a monster in the seas, bursting forth in your rivers, troubling the waters with your feet and fouling their rivers. And that's, you know, you're polluting, you're polluting the waters. You're polluting that which was meant to be a resource of your greatness. You're polluting it with your pride. You've got, you've got mud on your feet and, and you're destroying the very resources that I have given you that provided you the strength. So you, you turn around and, and you take all these resources, all these gifts, all these spiritual gifts uh, in, in our lives and you don't use them properly that, that spiritual gifts can build you up in pride as well as in humility. And we need to be on guard against that because we live in this wicked fleshly body. And, and the minute that you take any degree of God's glory, you are fouling you are polluting the very resources of greatness that he has provided to you. And thus says the Lord God, I will therefore spread my net over you with a company of many people. And I've never been captured in a net, but it doesn't seem very pleasant to my imagination. And again, these are pictures. They will draw you up in my net. Whose net is it? It's God's net. And then I will leave you on the land. I will cast you out on the open fields and cause to settle on you all the birds in the heavens. They'll, they'll come and consume your carcass, and with you I will fill the beasts of the whole earth. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your carcass. Again, very, very illustrative language. I will also water the land with the flow of your blood, even to the mountains, and the riverbeds will be full of you when I put out your light. <laughs> You're just going to become fertilizer. I, I will cover the heavens and, and make its stars Dark, I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. Again, we see some real end times references here reading into this, the, the kinds of things that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 about what would take place in the end of days. All the bright lights of the heavens I will make dark over you. I will bring darkness upon your land as took place in, in the ninth plague um, in Exodus chapter 18. I will bring darkness upon your land. Remember that, that inky black darkness that was darker than dark. I will also trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring your destruction among the nations into the countries which you have not known. Yes, I will make many peoples astonished at you and, and their kings shall be horribly afraid of you when I brandish my sword before them and they shall tremble every moment, every man for his own life in the day of your fall. For thus says the Lord God, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you. Shall. And it did. By the swords of the mighty warriors, all of them, the most terrible of the nations, I will cause your multitude to fall. They shall plunder the pomp of Egypt, and all its multitude shall be destroyed. Also I will destroy all its animals from beside its great waters. The foot of man shall muddy them no more, nor shall the hooves of animals muddy them. And then I will make their waters clear and make their rivers run like oil, says the Lord God. This is no empty threat. This is God saying this through Ezekiel to God's people about the, the future history of this nation as if it's already taken place. When I make the land of Egypt desolate and the country is destitute of all that once filled it, when I strike all who dwell in it, then, what will they know? Then they shall know that I am the Lord. When this prophecy is fulfilled, then. And, and that's what we see, isn't it? That's, that's the point of this compendium of books being approximately 40% filled with prophecy. And just seeing hundreds of prophecies fulfilled specifically pertaining to Messiah, that's how we know, isn't it? If you're looking for evidence, you can look at the back of your hand, you can read the word of God, and you can see the predictions 
that have already been fulfilled and remaining to be fulfilled. We know of the ones that remain to be fulfilled. They shall be fulfilled because the ones that were prophesied before have all been fulfilled, 100% of them. God's record in, in fulfillment of prophecy is absolutely 100% correct. And actually, he says, you know, in warning somebody who would speak forth a prophecy, if they speak forth something that doesn't happen, you should put them to death because that didn't come from God. And that's dangerous to speak forth prophecies that shall not be, for, that, you know, to, to presume to speak for God in a way that would dismay or distract or dissuade people in a way that, is, that puts them outside of God's will. God's going to deal with that. This is the lamentation with which they shall lament her. The daughters of the nation shall lament her. They shall lament for her, for Egypt, and for all the, her multitude, says the Lord God. And here's the sixth and final vision. And this vision is given in April 15th, 586. And it spans to April the 1st, 585 B.C., eight months after the fall of Jerusalem uh, by the end of this sixth and final vision. It came to pass in the twelfth year on the fifteenth day of the month that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, wail over the multitude of Egypt and cast them down to the depths of the earth, her and the daughters of the famous nations with those who go down to the pit. Whom do you surpass in beauty? Go down, be placed with the uncircumcised. So if you're the most beautiful person in the history of the world and you wind up in Sheol with the uncircumcised, what good has your beauty done for you for your life? You know? That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Don't focus on, on worldly things. Focus on heavenly things. Your wealth, your beauty, it can be the greatest in the history of the world. And if you wind up in Sheol, if you wind up in the pit, if you wind up ultimately in, in Gehenna, in the lake of fire, uh, after the great white throne judgment, your name not written in the Lamb's book of life, um, what good has it done you? What good? And this is what the Lord references, the, the Pharaoh and all his beauty and all his greatness. They shall fall in the midst of those slain by the sword. So there's no difference between the most common man, the most common house slave in Egypt, once dead, is as mighty as the king, um, there's, there's no difference. No difference at all when they go down into Sheol. I was watching the, uh, some of the outtakes of Queen Elizabeth's funeral, and uh, somebody, one of the commentators, I don't know who it was, a British person, made a, a really interesting comment that really struck me. And, and fortunately, you know, when it comes to Queen Elizabeth, we have a lot, a lot of quotes that have come out that she spoke about her love for the Lord Jesus Christ and how she looked forward to, you know, if he came back um, in her presence that she would have the opportunity to offer her, you know, offer him her crown, you know, receiving the, the crown of glory and, and her language was great. But one of the commentators made this statement that really applies here and that, you know, as the queen's coffin was being lowered down, I didn't even know that was going to happen, but they lowered her coffin down into the crypt there at St. George's Cathedral. In, in London, and as it was going down, one of the commentators said, well, you know, she's one of the people now. And that really struck me. She's one of the people now. Of course, she always was, uh, even in her own sight. She had a humility about her, but she was regarded as special, as, as extraordinary, you know, not just one of the people as she walked the earth, but in death, she's one of the people now. That was the comment, and it really spoke to me, you know. That, that we're all the same the moment we take our last breath. And the question will be, what have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ? That is what makes a difference once you've taken your last breath. And we're all going to take our last breath unless Jesus comes to rapture us out of this place. And maybe even we'll take a last breath even as we're raptured because I think the atmosphere is going to be different. So they shall fall in the midst of those slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword, drawing her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with those who help him. They have gone down. They lie with the uncircumcised, those apart from the covenant of God, slain by the sword. 
And what he's saying to Pharaoh here prophetically is when you get to hell, all these nations that followed after you are going to greet you there because that's where your leadership delivered them. So Assyria is there in hell in Sheol and all her company with the graves all around her, all, all of them slain, fallen by the sword. Her graves are set in the recesses of the pit and her company and, and is all around her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who, who caused terror in the land of the living. Assyria sure did that, and God doesn't like nations that cause terror in the land of the living. He judges them. There is Elam and, and all her multitude, all around her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who have gone down uncircumcised to the lower parts of the earth, who caused their terror in the land of the living. Now they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. They, they've set her bed in the midst of the slain with all her multitude, with the graves all around it, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Though their terror was caused in the land of the living, yet they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. The pit is a great equalizer, isn't it? It was put in the midst of the slain. That's where you'll find the pit. There are, there are Meshach, which is Turkey, and Tubal, which is also Turkey. And all their multitudes, we'll see them again when we get to uh, chapter 38 and 39. With all their graves around it, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Though they cause their terror in the land of the living, they do not lie with the mighty who are fallen of the uncircumcised, who have gone down to hell, or Sheol, with the weapons of war. They have laid their swords under their heads, by the, but their iniquities will be on their bones because of the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yes, you shall be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised and lie with those slain by the sword. Remembering this is a lamentation because, I mean, even as we're reading through this, we can be like, and God doesn't want us to feel that way. It's a lamentation. This is, you know, if, if I could read it with a woeful voice, you know, I, I would. And this is God's heart, you know, is, is a heart of, of woe, and woe is me, and lamentation. Uh, there's Edom, her kings and her princes, who despite their might are laid beside those slain by the sword. And by the way, this is a, sort of a reflection of those, maybe you, I hope not, I don't think about this with any of you, but you've come across people that say, I just want to go to hell and be with my buddies and hang out. That's exactly what's happening here. Okay, uh, Pharaoh, you know, this great, mighty man, you're going to be welcomed in hell by all your buddies. What good is that going to do you? You know, in, in flames of, of torment for all eternity because of the choices that you've made. So essentially what we're looking at here is, is all of Pharaoh's drinking buddies, you know, greeting him in hell, you know. It's horrific if you think about it. There's Edom, or kings, all our princes who are despite their might are laid beside those slain by the sword. They shall, be, they shall lie with the uncircumcised and with those who go down to the pit. There, there are the princes of the north, and all of them, and, and all the Sidonians, that, that, that great naval power um, from which Jezebel came, who have gone down with the slain in, in shame at, at the terror which they caused by their might. They lie uncircumcised with those slain by the sword and bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. And then here's the, the way this sort of wraps up. Pharaoh will see them. It's, it's certain. The course of his life, God knows he's not going to turn. God knows he's not going to repent. Pharaoh, this great, mighty figure, is going to join them in hell. Uh, don't look to Pharaoh to be your moral support or your military might during these days. And that was the situation. And that was what Jeremiah got, found himself caught up in the middle of and ended up causing their destruction. Pharaoh is going to hell. Pharaoh is going to join those others who have preceded him to hell under his leadership. Pharaoh will see them and be comforted over all his multitude. You could say misery loves company. Well, at least you're here in hell with me. Uh, some, something to that effect. Pharaoh, all, all his army, slain by the sword, says the Lord God. Why? For I have caused, you know, given the nature of their terror, I've caused my terror now 
in the land of the living. And he shall be placed in the midst of the uncircumcised with those slain by the sword, Pharaoh and all his multitude, says the Lord God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for, again, another one of your patented, wonderful warnings about the decisions and the term- determinations that we get to make in our individual lives and also, Lord, in the kinds of determinations that great nations make uh, regarding who is the source of their power and their wealth and their might. And, Lord, we see the, the foolishness of even beginning to think of ourselves great based on our own mental or moral abilities rather than according to the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that has been made to pay the price for the existence of a nation like ours. And so, Lord, uh, even though we look and see, we can't see any reference to the United States of America in an end times prophecy, not, not in anything distinct and direct uh, that everyone could agree upon. Lord, we're, we're humbled by that, and we, wondered, you know, we wonder what could happen to this nation and, and where the nations of this earth will look for the, the sufficiency of, of their supply or, or might or, or whatever uh, once this great nation passes from the scene. And Lord, we know the, the history of nations is they most often crumble from the inside. And, and uh, I honestly believe, Lord, in prayer that, that this is taking place now in our, in our lifetimes. And, and uh, you've given us a cause to fight for. And uh, you've, you've set us in this place, in this time, uh, to be a, a light uh, to a world that grows ever darker. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would take that light and be responsible with it and use that, that saltiness uh, of what it means to be a believer in Christ uh, to have an effect, maybe not on the nation, but on our locality, in our homes, uh, with our families. And these are the kinds of things that we pray for here tonight. And uh, just while we remain in an attitude of prayer, hey, you know, these, these clear distinctions that have been offered here tonight, just as they were on Sunday morning, that, that these things are going to happen, and it is going to play out this way. And you're either going to spend eternity in heaven or you're going to spend eternity in hell, and the choice is yours. And God's not happy about anyone who chooses to turn away from him and remain uncircumcised in the language that was employed tonight uh, to reject the blood of Jesus that has paid the price already for their sin and, and to, die, to choose to die in their sins rather than receiving the forgiveness that only comes by the blood of Christ, it seems like such a foolish decision. It seems like such a foolish direction to take in your life. And, and that's part of the reason these chapters are here. Look how foolish these men were. They could have chosen God at, at any time. They could have looked to the, to the Lord for salvation and instead they built themselves up in their own wealth and in their own pride and their own might and they turned away from God and they shunned any sort of discovery or any any attempt by God to to come into their lives and so we are among the most blessed because God is all around us and God is available to us and, and the word of God is always near to us in this nation one of the most blessed peoples in the history of the world regarding and in this time in these last days you have the chance uh, to place your faith in Jesus Christ tonight and there's nothing that can stop you from doing that but your own self so I want to give you the opportunity to pray I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer right now if you would like to choose Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life to to be the master of your salvation to be the love of your life to to place your faith and trust in, in the truth Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life for for everlasting life in Christ, then pray these words with me. And you can pray them either out loud or silent in your heart. It doesn't matter. God sees, God knows. You're not joining our church. We don't even have a membership. It's not about Calvary Chapel. It is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you give your life to him tonight? I plead with you. Will you give your life to Jesus Christ? Lord, if you will, pray these words with me. Lord Jesus, by the way, the words don't save you. It's the attitude of your heart that saves you. Lord Jesus, I open my heart. And I invite you inside to be my Lord, to be my God, to be my Savior, and to be my friend. 
Wash me clean, I pray, of all of my sins. For I've decided this night to follow you, Jesus, forever and ever. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're